Okay, so thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about containers with an eye to reproducibility. And um, we'll see that containers really help work become reproducible, but they're not a complete solution. And many of the assumptions that we make in data science might make our work actually not reproducible. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, Will is going to give us a surprising pitfall that you might fall into if you do actually make your work too reproducible. I'm Sophie, I'm a data scientist at Red Hat and I like to help our customers get their machine learning workloads and workflows running on top of our platforms. I like to do this with an eye for data scientists. So how can we make things as simple as possible for data scientists? Hi, I'm Will. I work on data science product strategy at NVIDIA. And like Sophie, I'm really concerned with um, sort of making practitioner experience as simple as possible. Um, and also like Sophie, I'm not speaking for my employer in this talk. So one thing that's really revolutionized software development recently is the ubiquity of container platforms and specifically Kubernetes. And when you think about containers for data science, probably the first advantage you think of is I can put everything I care about in an immutable image and run it again anytime, right? So with the container, with a container image, you have a base image, which is an operating system. You have some layered images on top of that that have sort of user space libraries. And then finally you have your application code, your notebooks, your models, whatever you wanna run. And the nice thing about these is that you can refer to them by their identity. So you can always go back and say, hey, this is a container that I was using on the 17th of June to serve a model, for example. And that's really nice if we want to sort of make comparisons between what we're running now and what we were running in the past, or if we're interested in sort of answering a question about why we made a particular decision, which we might need to do for GDPR compliance, for example. Now, a container platform like Kubernetes extends this immutability from these containers that we have that we can put into production to our entire applications. We can basically define our applications as code, right? So we can say, I have a bunch of services that cooperate together in an application, and I have some code that describes how they're connected together, and I can put this in version control with the same code that I build the containers from. And I can get you know, a lot of benefits for having reproducible work. I can roll back to an older environment. I can reproduce the application that I have in production, in development, um, and in test modes to try things out. And I can move things to new infrastructure with a lot less effort than I would have been able to do in the past. And another real advantage of these kinds of platforms is the ubiquity of continuous integration and continuous deployment. Everyone's had code that works on their laptop, but nowhere else. Uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment take you from that world to a world in which you have code that you commit to a source repository, and then you run some tests in a controlled environment that's ideally an exact replica of the environment that you're going to run in production. If you pass those tests, well, then you can build a container, and you can build a container for every component of your application. And again, because the way that you fit these things together to make your overall application is also code, you can go on and then have that declarative deployment that you put into production after testing it somewhere else. So I'll hand over to Sophie now to talk about why this isn't the whole solution. Thanks, Will. So containers, along with this discipline and software engineering tools, can really help work become reproducible. And over the last couple of years, Will and I have tried to improve the level of discipline that we certainly have when we're doing data science by using these tools of software engineers. So we focused on these CICD pipelines to aid reproducing specified experiments inside specified environments. But even if we can convince data scientists to be as disciplined as software engineers, there's still some surprising ways in which we can fall short of reproducibility. And that's what we'll talk about in the rest of this talk. But before we dive in, why do we even care about reproducibility? Well, reproducibility is important for research, for supporting collaboration between colleagues, and for knowing that what you put into production is behaving in the same way as it was when you ran it locally. It's also really important for answering questions with stakeholders and auditors. 
And the way that we see it, there's three overarching causes of things not being reproducible. The first is human discipline. The second, underspecified dependencies. And the third, undefined or unspecified behaviors. So let's look at some assumptions that we often make about our work or our environments and talk about why they're not usually true. First up, I think we all like to assume that humans are trustworthy and act deterministically. But that's not always the case. So when data scientists do work, often I like to work in a Jupyter notebook, and it's commonly believed that these notebooks are a great way to share work and make work reproducible, meaning that I can get a notebook from a colleague and run it like this to reproduce their results. Now, in fact, that's not really the case. These notebooks aren't always as reproducible as you'd like, because really you've got no idea how your colleague ran the cells in that notebook or what they did after they ran them. So perhaps they didn't run all of the cells. In which case the results you'll get or the artifacts that your notebook is gonna save to file is gonna differ from what you get if you ran it straight from top to bottom. And perhaps, they go ahead and run one cell more than once. Again, altering the output and changing the result from what you'd get if you ran it yourself. Or maybe if they're being really mean, they've gone back and edited the code and the cells um, once they've run them. So there's actually no way you could ever reproduce the results that they did unless you had a time machine and some inside knowledge into their mind. So really any artifact produced from a notebook, be it data analysis of that data, or maybe even a machine learning model, is often not what you expect it to be. These notebooks aren't as robust and reproducible as we'd like them to be. And this is because we as humans and as data scientists aren't perfectly disciplined. Another assumption that we often take for granted when trying to reproduce results is the assumption that we're running against the same versions of libraries that the code was developed against. And we'll see this in a few different, uh, come up in a few different ways. But let's say I developed some technique in a notebook and I wanna share my results with a colleague. One model for sharing this work is the model that Binder uses where I commit my work and a requirement specification to source control and send the Git coordinates to another service. That service builds a container image consisting of a basic user space, the library dependencies of my work, and a particular version of my notebooks themselves from the Git repo. It then spawns a container from this image on Kubernetes and exposes an HTTP route. So as long as the image still exists or the git commit object still exists and the dependencies are still resolvable, someone can run in a notebook in exactly the same environment I ran it in in the first place again and again. And this gets around that problem that Sophie was talking about, right? If we share notebook containers rather than notebooks, we know that we can always start from scratch and try and reproduce them exactly. But there's a wrinkle, right? And the binder model is great for reproducibility, but it's clunky for development. You don't want to rebuild a container from a Git repo every time you change your code or change your library dependencies. So there's a different model, which is what JupyterHub and Kubeflow notebooks use. And this keeps your mutable notebooks in a persistent volume and uses one or more containers to run those notebooks against with sets of library dependencies. You can also install libraries ad hoc from notebooks by calling a pip install from within your notebook. And these will stick around as long as the container is running, but they add an element of your reproducibility. So with this model, you have a more convenient development environment, but you need to depend on some human discipline since you need to worry about specifying the right container image with the right library versions, including any libraries that you've installed in an ad hoc fashion into that running container, and that you have a particular version of that notebook from your persistent volume. So now we have two things to worry about that are coupled together and there's nothing sort of atomically coupling them together, right? We don't have a declarative deployment for this notebook. We have run these notebooks against this container image. So that flexible environment that we want for development can make it more difficult to reproduce our work if we're not careful. We can't just worry about a particular image or a particular set of code. We need to make sure we have the right combination of container image and notebook state to reproduce results. A second challenging assumption about libraries is that we've sufficiently specified the libraries we're depending on. 
If you work in the Python ecosystem, there's a good chance that you've written a requirements.txt file that looks like this. And you should probably update your dependencies if, if your requirements.txt file looks exactly like this. But essentially what we're saying in this one is that we want an exact version of pandas, at least a given version of scikit-learn, and we're sort of indifferent about the version of NumPy, as long as the version of NumPy we get works with everything else we have. Now, those of you who work in the Python ecosystem a lot and are focused on distributing your work and sharing it, know that you can freeze these library versions to the ones that actually got installed in your environment by using pip to write out a new file like this. Use the pip freeze option, and that will generate a new file. But you'll still need to make sure that things work as you expect because this is going to fix you at certain versions and they may not be the versions that you know are ideal. You know, maybe someone else installs your work and they get a different version than you did and then they freeze, right? So in this case, if you developed against NumPy 1.16, for example, and someone else froze your dependencies at NumPy 1.17, there are over a hundred behavioral changes between those two versions of NumPy, even though the version number difference isn't that great. Now, a lot of those differences are in corner cases, but you might be depending on one of these. And if you're going to a current version of NumPy, like 1.20 or 1.21, you know, maybe because you, you need to move on to a new architecture or get, get better performance, and you're not going to use the same version that you've been using for the last few years, there are going to be even more changes to worry about. Another thing that you might need to worry about with NumPy is who built the version of NumPy that you're using. This is something that a lot of people don't even think about. And depending on where you get a package, whether you get it from PyPy or Conda or from a vendor, a package like NumPy is going to be built against a linear algebra library. And there are tons of options. I've listed just four of them that run on CPU. If you have a linear algebra library running on the GPU, you have more options still. And there are a lot of potential performance and even correctness differences between these libraries. And it's basically an opaque detail to end users. So this is another thing to worry about. And even if you're okay with updating and changing your library versions, you kind of are also assuming that if you're executing the same code, you're going to get the same results even after upgrading these libraries. But there's an important way in which library behavior can change. And this is really just a special case of keeping track of your dependencies, but it's one that I hadn't thought about until it bit me. So if you're training a model, there's some decisions being made for you behind the scenes, whether you like it or not. Say we want to quickly test out a logistic regression model and we don't really care about parameters. Well, Scikit-learn does care about parameters. If you look at the docs, if you fit a logistic regression to some data using a library and you don't specify any parameters, some parameter choices are still being inherently made for you. So you might think, okay, I can live with that, but wait. The choices get upgraded and updated with versions. So if you update Scikit-learn to keep with the times, um, your hyperparameters will be changed out from under your feet, potentially. And this might seem fine if you're just experimenting, but at some point you're gonna go from experimentation to production. And so it's best practice to just be explicit with parameter values from the start. Another possible library dependency headache is the headache of soft dependencies. And this is where a package behaves differently if something else is installed, but it doesn't require that that thing is installed. So we'll look at one example now. This is actual code from the Seaborn library, which is a popular plotting library in Python. And basically what this does is this sets a global variable to true if it can successfully import another library. So Seaborn tries to import the stats models library. If it does, it sets this to true and behaves differently throughout the rest of the library. And if it sets, if it doesn't, it sets it to false and disables some functionality that depends on stats models. Now, in the case of Seaborn, this means that you might have a plot that you expect a kernel density estimate on, and you'd get it if you have stats models installed, and you don't if you don't. But there are other examples where the behavior can be totally different. Um, if you're loading a Parquet file from Pandas, for example, depending on which Parquet library you have installed, neither of which is a hard dependency of pandas there. You could use Pyro or fast parquet. You might be able to use different compression types or have access different data types in your parquet file. Even that's, that's sort of a correctness issue. 
Um, if you're using Spark in Python with the Pandas library, um, you know, Pandas is not a hard dependency of Spark, but Spark will let you interoperate with Pandas if you have it installed. So you may have an application that depends on having Pandas installed in Spark that you can't run if you don't have Pandas installed uh, because the person who the person who developed the application just assumed that it would be available. Another dangerous assumption we make is that we're using pseudo random number generators in a way that will support truly reproducible results. Now, we know pseudo random number generators are deterministic, but are they deterministic enough? When you ask a pseudo random number generator for some numbers, in this case, when we're asking NumPy for 1,024 uniformly distributed random numbers, you're basically asking it to seek through a stream generated by a function. So if we ask for 1,024 random numbers, we'll get something that looks like this. The x-axis is the position in the stream. The y-axis is the generated number. So by inspection, this doesn't look obviously not uniform, right? Uh, there aren't any obvious autocorrelations. The result at position x doesn't seem to be correlated with the result at position x plus 1 or x plus 5 or x plus 10. No lines going through the, going through the graph like that. And if we ask for 1,024 numbers again, we'll get the next 1,024 numbers from that generator. And as you can see, these are different numbers. So since we're taking numbers from a deterministic stream, if we want actually repeatable results as opposed to results that are merely repeatable within some margin of error, we'll need to control where the stream starts. And we do this by providing a seed or initial value. So if we seed our generator before taking some numbers, we'll get a sequence of numbers. If we seed the generator the same way again, we'll get the same results again. So seeding your random generator, number generators is table stakes for actually reproducing results. And a lot of people know this, but using a global generator, like the random function from the random module in the Python library or in NumPy has some other pitfalls. So you wanna do this in any case, but since you use random numbers for different purposes in programs, it's better and leads to more reproducible results to use separate streams of pseudo random numbers for different purposes. If you're running a simulation, for example, and you want one distribution for inner arrival time between events and another distribution for how many items a customer has when they check out of a store, right? You want different pseudo random number generators for that. So the global generator, so you're not dependent on the ordering of calls to the global generator across these different parts of your program. So to get these, we'll use the random class in the Python library um, or the generator class in NumPy. And if you're still using NumPy 1.17, like we were earlier in our slides, you'll want to use random state instead. Now, you won't always use a random pseudo random number generator explicitly. And a lot of times, libraries that we use in this space will call out to one implicitly. And this can be a really subtle source of irreproducible behavior. In this case, we're reading a pandas data frame from Parquet, and we're sampling from that data frame. Now, pandas is using the global NumPy generator to do this. So we're either going to have to figure out that the library function lets us specify a seed to the library we're using. And this is, this is a, an approach that's sort of fraught with pitfalls because you have to specify a different seed every time you call this. Or you'll need to figure out which global generator the code is using and seed that appropriately before you enter it. So this is this can be really tricky and sort of depending on the behavior of these functions that depend on pseudo random number generators can really introduce some reproducibility challenges to your code. Another interesting consequence of pseudo random number generators is when you run machine learning or ETL or feature extraction code in a distributed fashion. If I have a job that I'm spread out across multiple workers, there's a really interesting reproducibility consequence to this. Um, obviously, I can't have a single pseudo random number generator across all of these workers. So do I use one pseudo random number generator per worker? That makes sense, right? Then I have a separate source of randomness in each worker. They're all independent. I don't have to worry about it. The problem is that then the behavior of my program is dependent on how I deploy it. So if I have one pseudo random number generator for each of these four workers, and I run the program again with six workers, I'm gonna get different results because I'm gonna have different pseudo random number generators for each of those six workers. Here's a related problem. 
hatching. We use hashing all the time for data processing, uh, data sketching at scale, and for a lot of machine learning techniques as well. Hashing is an important component of many feature engineering techniques. And hash, you know, the hashes that we have available to us, especially if we have a generic one called hash, it may not be the same function in multiple environments. So if I'm, you know, characterizing documents, for example, and I want a hashed term vector, if I run this pipeline in two different environments, I might get two different vectors. So this is a real problem in going from experimentation to production, right? If I train a model with one hash function and, you know, try and score it with another, I'm going to get completely useless results. So we need that to be fixed across all of our environments. A more subtle way that hashing can cause problems is when I'm doing distributed data processing. In a lot of cases, we'll use a hash function to partition data across different workers. So in this case, maybe we have one hash function that distributes data like this. That's not perfect, but it's okay, right? But we might have another hash function that we could run in a different version of our environment or in a different environment altogether that distributes data like this, where we have data skew, where that partition on the left has far more elements than the partition on the right. Now, this is a problem for two reasons. It's a performance problem, because instead of having the amount of time it takes to process these partitions be the average size of all the partitions, it's going to be based on the largest partition, right? If, we, if we're not distributing them evenly. Another problem, though, is that if we're using pseudo random number generators in the processing, having a different number of elements across different runs in these partitions is going to lead us to different results. So, again, something else to worry about. So as if that wasn't enough to worry about, everything we've talked about today is in the context of data science and you can't do data science without data. But data itself brings with it many barriers to reproducibility. If you can't get your hands on the data, um, it doesn't matter how disciplined you are when you're running your notebooks or pipelines or how well you documented your dependencies, you won't be able to reproduce any of the results. So we're gonna assume that you've got the data, but which bits of the data did you use to train a certain model? Did you train your model using all the data you've ever seen ever? Did you train all the data that's streamed into the system in the last 24 hours or the last 25 hours? And how did you treat that data in your transformation from raw data to something that you can work with? What did you do about missing data? Did you impute? Did you drop all entries that have any missing values and so on? So we've seen a lot of subtle ways in which our work might not be reproducible, but how are we gonna avoid these pitfalls and make sure that our work is as reproducible as possible going forward? Well, first up, do not depend on humans. Now that's easier said than done, but doing it as much as possible is great. If we can do so, we remove a lot of ambiguity in the workflow by making sure that a machine can reproduce results from start to finish. It's also really important to have a chain of custody for the data and the code. You need to know exactly where it all came from, what versions are being used, any explicit details of data transformations and code and data dependencies. And finally, you need to watch out for features in that code that's going to make it less reproducible. So getting human behavior out of the way isn't the be all and end all. If we're relying on machines, we've still got to think about things like pseudo random numbers. How is the notebook seeded in the first place? Perhaps we can be clever here. For example, we could write a script to seed all the global generators at the beginning of each notebook cell. So you know what to look for to try and avoid these common pitfalls that keep your work from becoming reproducible. But actually having reproducible work can get in the way of doing responsible data science if you're not careful. There's a pitfall to making things too perfectly reproducible. We promised you this earlier in the talk and here it comes. So if you're training a model using standard training and validation practice, you're gonna start by taking some subset of your data, fitting your feature extraction pipeline, training a model, and then seeing how that model performs. 
And then we're going to go back and take the data that we held out, the data that we didn't train the model on, run it through the feature extraction pipeline that we fitted on the bulk of the data, and run it through the model that we trained and see how it performs on the data that it hasn't seen. And we are in particular looking out to see if the performance is materially worse on the data it hasn't seen than it is on the data it has seen. And why do we care about doing this? Well, if we were in the same room, I'm sure many of you would be answering, but what would they be answering, Sophie? Is it overfitting? Exactly, yeah. We wanna make sure that we've generalized from our training data, that we're not just memorizing what we've seen. And the more that we run a machine learning pipeline on all the data that we have, the more likely we are to just be optimizing for working well on only the data that we've seen. Now, the problem with making it super easy to do reproducible work is that you can run hundreds or even thousands of experiments over time. And, you know, maybe you're hyperparameter fitting, maybe you're retraining a model regularly and tuning parameters based on the performance that you see. But if you do this a bunch of times, well, how does a machine learning algorithm work? A machine learning algorithm is going to be trying to find the best fit for some coefficients based on performance over repeated iterations and it's trying to get closer to those ideal coefficients, right? Well, if I run a lot of experiments and I make changes based on the results of those experiments, I've basically turned myself into an undisciplined, irreproducible machine learning algorithm, right? And I'm going to overfit because I have not just the training and validation results, but I have the results from the whole pipeline. So I'm really a machine learning algorithm in this case as a practitioner who's looking at the whole data set over and over again. So there are a lot of ways to get around this, but one way is to always hold out some data or to age out data from training sets and just to be careful about whether or not you have a bigger pipeline that's introducing the potential for overfitting in a way that you don't at the micro level. All right, so that was a whistle stop tour of some of the things that you need to worry about if you want your results to be truly reproducible when you're doing data science. We talked about um, these pitfalls that crucially Kubernetes won't insulate you from. You'll have to use some discipline and additional tools to make sure that you're being reproducible. It's a lot of fun to be here at Buzzwords. Thank you all for your time and have a good evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world.